Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Wednesday live stream. We got a lot of things to go over, so let's just jump right into it. So today, just like the title and thumbnail suggest, uh, looks like inflation has decreased to under 3% the first time since 2021. So the projections were anywhere between 2.7 and 3.1, and we came in roughly at 2.9% for the CPI data, and that is great, and the markets are responding. But remember, it's not just about just the month to month, it's the year over year. But if we take a look at it, and there's a great video that kind of explains like how this all works as far as like inflation. And uh, we're gonna, I'm just gonna play this for you real quick. It's like around 30 seconds or so, but then we're gonna get into the actual report. And then we're gonna get into some more really, really good news. And then we're gonna get into some not so good news because on this channel, I can't feed you hopium constantly. You gotta have balance. So just take a listen to this. I think this uh, pretty much sums it up in about 30 seconds. That's the cost of living crisis. Suddenly we went up from prices being around there to prices being there. And you don't really see that in this data, okay? Because inflation is really just measuring the difference between that and that. And if you look at those two lines, you're talking about a 2.3% change. That's the number we're talking about today. But for a lot of people, it's not about that. It's about the difference between this and that. And when you look at the difference between this and that, that's 20%. And I think that's the dichotomy here between these inflation numbers where it looks normal and this, which is really not normal at all. That's the cost of living. So yeah, so just remember that, you know, as we're talking about like 2.9%, 3%, be like, oh, that's pretty good. But of course, I think we all know, we all feel this in our pocketbook when we take a look at, uh, I don't know, the prices of gas and the prices of, uh, you know, real estates and the prices of actually rent and the price of all the different food items that we have to pick up. It's expensive. And that's really what it comes down to. So yes, we are going down. Yes, this will be good in the long run, but I still think we have a, a little ways to go. So this was actually uh, a post that I put out yesterday, roughly around I don't know, three, four o'clock. And I want to give out a shout out to Trueflation. And they even said it, they actually sent me their report and they said, uh, they said, hey, we're forecasting the CPI numbers will come in at 2.8% tomorrow, which pretty damn close. They were at, uh, it was 2.9 while the market expectations between 2.7 and 3.1. So they pretty much nailed it. Last month was 3% year over year inflation. So again, we're going down. If you want to take a look at trueflation, I know some people say, well, who cares about trueflation? Because you know that's not what Jerome Powell takes a look at. That's not what everybody takes a look at. No, but it gives you a forward looking perspective of what really is actually going on as they use real world data. So shout out to trueflation for actually putting that out link in the description. And this, of course, is the data itself, like we just talked about. Uh, CPI data is uh, down 3% since 2021. Consumer prices rose 2.9% in the year through July, downtick from last month. The cooling is likely to keep the Federal Reserve, and this is the most important part, on track to cut interest rates next month. We'd like to see a cut. We'd like to see the macro kind of cool down. And of course, what does that happen when they cut the rates? Well, generally, naturally, we start to fire up the old printers, and that's what America is good at. And when we have quantitative easing, that's where the liquidity comes in, and that's where the market starts to really go crazy. So how did the markets respond to this news, which just came out recently? Or if you you know, followed Trueflation or me, you kind of knew where things were going. Pretty good. I mean, over 24-hour time frame. And we can see that Bitcoin is up 3.2% uh, over 24 hours, Ethereum 2.9, tell that nobody really cares, BNB 1.6. But if you take a look at the one hour, you're like, what the heck happened? We just got this data like an hour ago and now we're down 1%. Well, usually what happens is this, people front run the markets, they kind of, they hear things from somebody else and they put in their orders and they maybe lever up and uh, they're taking profits. If that's a surprise to anybody, I have a bridge to sell you. So. That's what's usually going to happen. Nothing goes up in a straight line. And uh, I think in the long run, like I've said before, this is looking pretty good. And of course, uh, if we take a look at a spectrum across uh, the lack, like in the top 10, we can say Solana in 24 hours is, hey, Solana's doing pretty good. It's up half a percentage in the last hour. 2.7 XRP, one before. Why do I look at Tuncoin? Tuncoin is up 11% in 24 hours. Of course, people taking profits but it's up 24% in the week. What the hell is going on with Tuncoin? Well, first of all, I think we all know I'm a big fan. And uh, really what it comes down to is Tuncoin's trying to be a super app. I did a video and I don't talk about the coin itself, but I talk about the apps that are in Telegram. Telegram is a messaging service. 
and they're going just like what WeChat did from messaging to a super app. And I take a look at the 14 top apps that are rolling out. This is very new. This is in the last three or four months that they've actually rolled these things out. And I think people are sleeping on it quite heavily. So uh, take a look at that. Um, but be before we go on, I just want to say that I know when people when people hear me talk about like TonCoin or Solana or whatever else, they're like, oh, Rob must be you know, poo-pooing all over my project. What about Cardano? What about Algorand? What about Near? So here's what I have to say to that, which is this. I own a lot of altcoins. And I, I have to keep repeating this because I don't think people get it. Your altcoin that you're investing into is probably going to do pretty good in the bull market, right? I have a belief. And the, and the reason why I have 70% of my uh, crypto wealth in Bitcoin, 70%, and the rest in like 65 to 72 different altcoins is because I personally believe that certain chains do certain things and the future is multi-chain. When I talk about TonCoin, when I talk about Solana, when I talk about Cardano, it's because I feel that they have their own use cases. And I think there's enough room for everybody. Like Cardano, I just see it as the safest. Never goes down, community is fantastic. Solana is one of the fastest. And if you like meme coins and gambling, that's your, your place. And they're probably going to go far. Near, if you're looking at for sharding and for AI and for really getting products out there, that's your, that's your play. Ethereum is great because it's been around for so long. Layer 2 solutions, you name it. And then TonCoin, like I talked about before, is because I see them being a super app and using those apps and having their own ecosystem. I mean, for Pete's sakes, uh, TonCoin, or excuse me, uh, Telegram has almost a billion users. Do you think that if Facebook actually got that Libra project off the ground that we wouldn't be buying it because it's too centralized? Yeah, right. Look at BNB. So again, when I talk about these things, don't think that I'm just like, you know, I'm going to the dark side in only one place. I like them all. I mean, for the most part. And really to sum it up, it's like this. This is how everything in social media works because that little rant that I gave you, I can't give that to you every day. But, you know, I might talk about Solana one day and people are like, oh, you're Solana bull now. And that's what it is. It's like this. I might say, hey, I prefer mangoes to oranges. And then people will hear that and go, oh, so what you're saying is you hate oranges? Uh, you also fail to mention pineapples, bananas, and grapefruits. Educate yourself, fool. I'm literally shaking. That's pretty much <laughs> what, what it's like to do a live stream. So just take that with a grain of salt. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I do like reading those. And let's go into some more good news. So Goldman Sachs, latest 13F finally discloses that. Uh, and it's a funny thing because I remember Goldman Sachs was kind of poo-pooing all over crypto and digital assets uh, previously. And I think we all know that once people come out, like a Jamie Dimon and stuff like that, and start saying, oh, it's awful. It's usually when they're filling up their bags. You know, There's a public persona and there's a private persona. Here's Goldman Sachs. Uh, 238.6 million iShares of in the Bitcoin trust, they must believe in it. You know, when you put a quarter billion dollars into something, it's not like you're like, oh, let's just gamble. 79.5 million is in the Fidelity Bitcoin ETF. 35 million is in the Grayscale Bitcoin. I don't know why, they're probably getting out. 56 million Vesco Galaxy Bitcoin, 8.3 million Bitwise Bitcoin ETF. I find it interesting that they go between different ETFs, but maybe they're just trying to you know, diversify different portfolios as far as like the fees, I'm not for sure. 749,000 of Wisdom Tree and uh, almost 300,000 of ARC 21 shares of Bitcoin ETF. That's a total of almost half a billion dollars in Bitcoin ETF. So if you're looking for signs of adoption and uh, TradFi coming in, there's your stance. Also, uh, Hunter Horsley, he is the CEO of Bitwise Investment. He put out this tweet. A well-known bank with one trillion in client assets has just been approved the Bitwise Crypto Industry Innovators ETF for solicited access across wealth management. Let me say that again. Trillion dollar bank. They're, they're giving the go-ahead for solicited access across wealth managers. What do you think they're going to say? Look, we just, we just found the uh, most successful ETF of all time. And we think that you should probably get into it to diversify. Not like put your whole life savings, but maybe 2% to 5% and see where things go. We think things are going to go up. And this is why. We're a trillion dollar asset, asset under management. What do you think is going to happen? It's just a, it's a, it's a, just a trajectory up. But 
people will get scared. People will hear about the, the, the dreaded R word recession. They'll start selling and people become irrational, but just hold, just stick around. I think you're in the right place at the right time. And Hunter says, I'm thrilled to support these advisors and other stuff in Bitcoin and crypto entering the mainstream. And there's the disclosures and perspectives. So that's looking pretty bu bullish. I like that part. And here's the BitQ, and that's uh, Horsley right there, like in front of the New York Stock Exchange, making a boatload of money. Good for that guy. Not jealous, not jealous. But uh, the question then is, how are the ETFs doing? Well, quick little update. Ethereum is still, <laughs> is still negative. And we can see that against BlackRock, Fidelity, Bitwise. But the total, as far as outflows, because there's inflows and outflows, you're still at negative 377. Million. So, uh, yeah, Ethereum ETF. I know everybody's going to thought it was going to be awesome. It's not so far, but maybe things will turn around. I still hold Ethereum, like I said before. So, I mean, an ETF's an ETF. But if we take a look at the Bitcoin ETF, which has always been positive as far as net flows, we can see that as of yesterday, was it the 13th? Yeah, it is the 14th. Uh, 293,000. So that's not the all-time high for flows. We're, we're almost at 300,000 up here on August 1st. But again, still doing pretty good. Let's take a look at the flows themselves. And we can see that Grayscale continues to dump. BlackRock continues to impress with their inflows. And uh, yesterday was a positive flow. And I like to see that. So good news all around in the macro. Good news around for the ETFs. Good news around for the institutions. Now here's your bad news. I will not keep feeding you hopium. This is ridiculous. You got to kind of just kind of say, well, there is something that I should think about. Kamala Harris. Now, look, uh, I don't know who's going to win this presidential election. Quite honestly, I will support either candidate because you have to support the president. If Kamala Harris, is, it is great. Trump, it is great. If it's RFK Jr., great. Uh, but we're not a, we're not a show that, talks about you know the stances of you know where 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 these candidates are on like immigration and where they are against wars it's just crypto so just so you know and i have reported on good news that you know kamala harris and her team have been uh, engaging uh, with the different uh, crypto communities and they've been very receptive but uh, there's been no real known parts as what Vice President Kamala Harris is actually going to do. But if we take a look at some of these campaign promises and the people that are around her, it's not looking good. And again, I said this was just a campaign promise. Kamala Harris proposes a 28% crypto tax on wealthy crypto holders. During a recent campaign stop in Georgia, VP Kamala Harris proposed raising the tax rate on crypto investors to 28% for the wealthy. The move is part of her broader economic policy, which aims to support the middle class and small businesses. Now, I don't know what it is. Here in America, we've got long-term and short-term capital gains. Usually on the short-term capital gains, that's uh, before one year. It is in your, your different tax bracket. So if you're in like 33%, then you're going to pay 33%. You're at 38%, you're going to pay 30%. But if they're talking about long-term capital gains, it's usually about 21%, roughly, give or take. And if they're saying that, okay, if you make over $400,000 and you're going to pay 28%, well, whatever. If you if you make you know uh, below that, that you're going to pay... Uh, this amount, but it looks like 28% is uh, where they're going for whatever they define that. And again, this is a campaign promise. I'm just giving you the news. It's up to you to determine if you are a one issue voter or if you are a multi issue voter. I'm not here to, <laughs> to take you any way, shape, or form because you're way smarter than me. And that's what it comes down to. And lastly, before we get to the QA, I will be uh, talking to the folks. I'll talk to uh, Luis over at Xborg. Uh, Xborg is essentially going to be able to give the identity or have the gamer identity, as I believe that Web3 Gaming is uh, potentially, and I think it's the future, especially as people own their assets. I will be doing an interview with them in about an hour or so, and I'll put that out later. And uh, if you want to know what Xborg is, they're having their TGE or token generation event right now. There's a link in the description where I talk about Xborg, but that's it for today. So look, if you like today's video, Give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive. Now, if you want to jump into the questions and answers, I'll answer all your questions to the best of my abilities. But if you got to take off, take off. Thanks so much, everybody. I appreciate you. And I'll see you on the next one. Also, if you're in Las Vegas this week, I will be there for Rare Evo to talk to a bunch of gamers and see what the heck's going on. Maybe I'll.
hit up Charles and uh, maybe if Mickey Watkins is, is there from World Mobile Token as we talk about the Earth Notes. All right, that's it.